Why does sodium explode in water while argon just sits there doing nothing? Why do some elements practically beg to bond and others act like they couldn't care less? Let's find out what makes Adam tick. Reactivity is how an atom behaves in a chemical reaction, how easily it bonds, breaks, resists, or explodes. It can show up as fizzing, flames, color changes, or total silence. So what controls it? Every atom has layers of electrons like planets around the sun. The outermost ones are called valence electrons and they are the only ones that matter in chemical reactions. Why? Because atoms want a full outer shell, that's the stable state. So they'll give, take, or share electrons to get there. Some atoms like chlorine need just one electron to feel complete. Others like sodium have one to spare. So sodium gives it up, chlorine takes it, and they bond. And just like that, they become something entirely new, table salt. Take a step back and look at the periodic table. There's more to eat than just rows and columns. It's a map. Where an element is tells you something important. How it behaves in a reaction, its reactivity. You start with group 1 highlighted here. All these elements, including hydrogen, have just one valence electron. That's their common feature. Now, a quick but important note. Hydrogen is here because of its single electron, but it behaves very differently. So let's focus on the elements below it. Lithium, sodium, potassium, and the rest. These are the alkali metals. They all share one key trait, one outer electron, and a strong drive to get rid of it. Why? Because losing that one gives them a full outer shell. It's quick, it's easy, and atoms like easy. That's what makes alkali metals so reactive. Now let's jump to group 17, the halogens, elements like fluorine, chlorine, and bromine. They all have seven valence electrons. They are just one electron short of a full outer shell. They don't want to lose electrons like group one. They want to gain one, just one. That single empty spot, it makes them highly reactive too, but for the opposite reason. While group one is eager to give, the halogens are desperate to take. They are the atomic thieves of the periodic table, always on the lookout for that one last electron. And finally, look at group 18, the noble gases. These atoms already have full outer shells. They don't want to gain, they don't want to lose. They are the introverts of the periodic table, totally stable, totally unreactive. No bonding, no trading, just chill. So what makes atom react? It comes down to valence electrons, how many they have, and how close they are to having a full shell. Some atoms give, some take, and some, they don't need to do anything at all. Think of it like a dance party. Group 1 is on the sidelines with one hand sticking out ready to give their electron away. Group 17 has one hand reaching out hoping to grab one. Group 18, they're already dancing in perfect circle. They don't need anyone else. They're content. And that's reactivity in a nutshell. Some atoms are looking to bond while others already have everything they need. But reactivity isn't just about what an atom wants, it's about how easy it is to make that happen. For metals like group 1 and group 2, that means how easily can they lose that outer electron. You see, just wanting a full shell isn't enough. The real question is this, how tightly does the nucleus hold on? That grip is the pull of the positive protons in the nucleus on the negative electron. And here's the key, the farther away that electron is, the weaker the pull, the easier it is to let go. That's where atomic size and position at the table comes in. On the left side of the periodic table, atoms are built to let go. They want to lose electrons fast. And no group shows this better than the metals of group 1. Take lithium. It's a small atom with only a couple of electron shells, giving it a small atomic radius. This short radius means a strong, strong pull from the nucleus on its outer electron. 
that tight grip makes lithium reluctant to give away that electron, which is why we see a slower reaction. But as you move down group 1, sodium to potassium and further, the atoms get bigger. Now, look at cesium. It's a much bigger atom, more shells, more distance, a larger atomic radius. This large radius creates a much weaker pull on that lone outer electron. The nucleus, shielded behind all those layers, can barely hold on. It's easy to lose. Cesium doesn't just lose its electron. It practically ejects it. The result? A violent, instantaneous reaction. The ultimate price of a weak grip. On the right side of the periodic table, the story flips. These atoms don't want to lose electrons, they want to gain one. Take fluorine. It's a small atom with a small atomic radius. Just a few shells, its nucleus is close to the edge. That means a short distance, a strong pull, a tight grip. So when fluorine sees an extra electron nearby, it pulls hard, it grabs fast, a quick and powerful reaction. But as you move down the group to chlorine, bromine, iodine, the atoms get bigger. More shells, more distance, a larger atomic radius. The nucleus is now much farther away. Even with more protons, the greater distance weakens the pull. The grip loosens. It's harder to attract and hold a new electron. That's why fluorine is the most reactive in the group. And iodine, with its large radius, has a slower reaction. So for these non-metals, the trend is the same but the goal is flipped. Smaller atoms, stronger pull, faster gain. Bigger atoms, weaker pull, slower reaction. But reactivity doesn't just change down a group. It also shifts as you move across a period. Now let's see what happens as we move across a period from left to right. A surprising thing happens, the atoms actually get smaller. Why? The number of electron shells stays the same but the nucleus gains more protons. Its positive charge grows stronger, pulling the electrons in more tightly. So even elements like boron, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, not as reactive as fluorine, it still have stronger pulls than the elements to their left. And that stronger pull changes everything. It makes gaining electrons easier and sharing electrons more likely. So across a period, atomic size shrinks but nuclear pull grows. And that increasing pull means a greater power to grab or share electrons. So remember, reactivity shifts not just down but across. So here's the big picture. On the left side, you have the metals, large atoms that lose electrons easily. On the right, the non-metals, small atoms that grab electrons quickly. This means reactivity increases down the left side, but up the right side. And it's all driven by the same two factors, atomic size and the nucleus pull. But then, all the way at the end, we have the noble gases. They don't lose, they don't gain. Their outer electron shells are already perfectly full. No pull, no push, just perfect stability. Unreactive, unbothered, complete. So what drives reactivity? It starts with valence electrons, those on the outer shell. They decide how easily an atom can give, gain, or share. That's why atoms in the same group are chemical copycats. They have the same number of valence electrons, so they react in similar ways. Across a period, atoms get smaller. The nucleus pulls harder, so reactivity shifts from losing electrons to gaining them. In the end, all atoms are chasing the same goal, a full outer shell. And that's the chemistry behind the copycats. I'm G, and I'll see you in the next lesson.